Hello everyone, I'm Iman Shuvas Nani from Department of Mechanical Engineering and I'm here with you to discuss on the subject Material Science. The subject code is ME207, the unit number 5, lecture number 36 in the series and today's topic is Fatigue Test, Creep Test, Scanning, Electron Microscopy, that is SEM, then Energy, Dispersive X-ray Spectroscopy, that is EDS, and X-ray Photoelectron Spectroscopy, that is XPS. So, learning objective for today's lecture are to provide the students with a basic understanding of fatigue test, creep test, scanning electron microscopy, SEM test, energy dispersive, X ray spectroscopy, and it is EDS test, then X ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and XPS test. And learning outcome of today's students are fatigue test, creep test, scanning electron microscopy, and the SEM test, energy dispersive X ray spectroscopy test, and EDS test. X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy test that is XPS and the students have understood the scanning electrons microscopy the same test in detail. So, so let us start with the impact test. Okay, is a basic test. So the impact tests are classified into two types. Maybe the isolated impact test or the Charpy impact test. Okay. Now the impact test is performed to study the behavior of materials under dynamic load. Okay, that is the suddenly applied load. Now we have studied about uh, like in the previous lecture we studied about hardness test and compressor test and tensile stress. So here we are talking about the impact test. Okay, now here the impact test is performed to study this behavior of materials under dynamic load that is the suddenly applied load. So the capacity of the material to understand or you can say the capacity of the material to withstand blows without fracture is known as the impact strength or the impact resistance okay so the impact test in indicates the toughness of the material the ability of a material to absorb energy during plastic deformation okay during plastic deformation so the toughness is a measure of both strength and ductility of a material so you can see in this diagram in there is an impact testing machine shown to you and in this you can see that uh, you can see that the position at rest where the mechanism is not shown it's, okay there's, there's position at rest okay and then you have this pendulum during swing you can see this it is going in this direction the arrows are shown okay and then you have a striking uh, striking edge you have a striking edge there okay and on the bottom side you can see there's an anvil and you have a specimen okay a kept at there and after you can see the motion that is going shown with the arrows okay that when uh, the position at rest is shown then the pendulum during swing is shown and then you can see there is an arrow flowing through the specimen okay and on the base so here in this you can show that this impact is made and we are doing this impact test this impact test is performed to study the behavior of materials under dynamic load that is suddenly applied load okay now the fatigue test okay after this because see the impact test is basically to know the capacity of the material that is the capacity of the material to withstand blows without fracture okay and it is known as the impact strength okay or the impact resistance now we'll talk about the impact for a fatigue test now when a material is subject to repeated stress i mean the when a material is subjected to repeated stress it fails at stress below the yield point stresses okay so stresses such type of failure of a material is known as fatigue when a material this is the subjected to repeated stresses it fails at stress below the yield point so such point such type of failure of a material is known as fatigue so it's the capacity of a material to withstand repeated supplied stresses so you can see this you have electric motor is capable of running around 10000 rpm so a large bearing whose purpose is to relieve the motor from the large bending movement which is applied to the specimen. Okay, so correct correct chucks is to used to hold the specimen. Okay, so revolution counter to count the number of revolutions is there. A rotating lever arm, which is subjected to a downward force in order to give the bending movement to the specimen. You can see in the diagram. Okay, you have these are support bearings are shown to you. Then there is specimen in the center. Okay, and you can see this the the how this specimen is rotating. Then you have a load bearings at the opposite end. You can see the bearings on the opposite side. Support bearings are there on the left hand side, and load bearings are there on the right hand side. 
so the specimen is in the form of a cantilever and load at one end through a ball bearing okay you can see the load bearing so the upper surface of the specimen is under tension and lower surface of the specimen is under compression so at this point when the material is subjected to repeated stresses and it fails at stress below a yielding point so such type of failure of a material is known as fatigue and this test is known as fatigue test okay so you can say this is the capacity of a material to withstand repeated applied stress so it is called as a fatigue test now sn curve or you can call it as a fatigue limit so this curve is drawn between stress and the cycle of stress okay this sn and stress and cycles of stress so here you can see that here the s is shown as the stress and n shows number of revolutions so several specimens are tested one by one above at gradually decreasing stress load and the number of cycles to failure in each is noted those are the results are presented as a graph with the stress level as plotted versus the number of cycles to failure such a plot is known as sn curve called a fatigue limit curve so two important information are obtained from sn curve like the endurance limit and the fatigue limit so you can define this endurance limit like it is defined as the maximum stress that can be uh, applied repeatedly for infinite number of times without failure of a material you can say endurance limit and this limit it is the li defined and this limit is defined as the maximum stress okay endurance limit it is defined as the maximum stress that can be applied repeatedly for infinite number of times without failure of the material and fatigue life what do you call it fatigue life the fatigue life it tells us how long a component survives at a particular stress level how long a component survives at a particular stress level now the creep test okay this is one of the very important test now you can see that there is a diagram okay you see that there is a constant force applied okay on in both the directions okay and then you have you can see at the center there is extension measured over gauge land you can have a thermocouple there okay so you can see the continuous deformation of a metal under a steady load the continuous deformation of a metal under a continuous under a steady load is known as creep so when a material is subjected to a static load at higher temperatures for a long periods the material deforms under stress well below the yield point i repeat understood this the under try to understand it the continuous deformation of a metal under a steady load is known as creep and when a material is subjected to static loads at higher temperatures for a long period the materials deforms under stresses well below the yield point now here you can see this is a creep curve shown to you in which you can see there are three stages before the fracture you know on you can see that on the vertical axis you have in strain and on the horizontal axis you are shown as time okay so initial load is depicted in this on the graph and then you can see a total elongation that happened in the three stages okay now here you are divided all the things into three stages stage 1 stage 2 and stage 3 like this primary creep creep and tertiary creep now in this what happens the the specimen is subjected to a constant load by means of dead weights and levers what is saying this spe the specimen here the specimen is subjected to a constant load by means of dead weights and levers so a tabular electrically heated furnace surrounds the specimen you can you have seen this in this diagram previously also they say that the specimen is subjected to a constant load to a constant load by means of dead weights and levers and a tabular electrically heated furnace surrounds the specimen so the ends of the specimen are sometimes fitted with thermocouple for the measurement of temperature or to maintain a constant temperature the total creep or percentage elongation can be measured by extensometer and the percentage elongation is plotted against time for the entire duration of the test now here in this you can see there's three types of creep of like one is called as primary creep so in this stage in this stage what happens the creep is mainly due to the dislocation movement the creep rate decreases with time then the secondary creep you say that during this stage the rate of work 
hardening and recovery are equal during this stage the rate of work uh, the, this is the longest stage you can say in this you can see this graph also stage 2 the second is you say that this during this stage the rate of work hardening and the recovery are equal so the material creep at steady rate you can see the steady rate. now the tertiary creep you know, okay, the third stage then in the stage the creep rate increases with time until structure occurs so generally the tertiary creep generally the tertiary creep occurs due to the necking of the specimen or the grain boundary sliding so curve creep is spotted between strain and time in hours so the factors affecting creep are like grain size and thermal stability of microstructure chemical reactions and the prior strain okay the prior strain of now let us discuss about sem test that is scanning electron microscopy this is very important test when you study about the microstructure of the material so let's start with this now scanning electron microscopy scans a focused electron beam over a surface to create an image okay the electrons in the beam they interact with the sample producing their signals that can be used to obtain information about the surface topography and composition but in this you are having information in sam test you can have information about the surface topography and the composition so here we start with this and why use electron instead of light in the microscope they say that given sufficient light the human eye can distinguish between two points 0.2 mm apart you see in this what happens given given sufficient light the human eye can it, uh, distinguish between two points okay, 0.2 mm apart without the aid of an additional lens okay so the distance this distance is called the resolving power this distance this distance around like this 0.2 mm apart the distance this distance is called as resolving power or resolution of the eye. So a lens or an assembly of lenses, that is a microscope, can be used to magnify this distance and enable the eye to see points even closer together than 0.2 mm. Now you can see in this diagram also it is shown to you that two points showing the limits of directions. Okay, you can see the resolving power here. Okay. Now here, with the modern light uh, microscope has the maximum mag magnification of around 1000x. Okay, so the resolving power of the microscope was not only limited by the number and quality of the lenses, but also by the wavelength of the light needed for illumination. Like the white light has wavelength from 400 to 700 nanometers. 10 to the power of minus 9 meters. Okay, so they say that white light has wavelength from 400 to 700 nanometers. So the average wavelength is 550 nanometers. If you take the average in this, they say that for the, for that white light has wavelength of around 400 to 700 nanometers, and the average wavelength is around 550 nanometers, which results in a theoretical limit of resolution, not visibility. Of the light microscope in white light of about 250 nanometers. Now the figure this shows the two points at the limits of detection, and the two individual spots can be distinguished. Now here in this in this image you can see the right image it shows two points so close that the central spots overlap. In this what happens? These two points they are so close together that the central spots overlap. The electron microscope was developed when the wavelength became the limiting factor in light microscopes. This electron microscope was developed when the wavelength. This electron microscope was developed when the wavelength became the limiting factor in light microscopes. So electrons have much shorter wavelength, enabling better resolution. Okay, see this. You can say you can call it as the a lens or an assembly of lenses or the microscope this can be used to magnify the this distances and this enables the eye, uh, the eyes to see points even closer than around 0.2 mm okay so in this what happens that the electron microscope this was developed when the wavelength became the limiting factor in light microscopes okay so the electrons which have much shorter wavelength they enabling better resolution now, if you compare an optical microscope versus a scanning electroscope microscope, so what they say 
you can see in this diagram in the bottom side so you have this optical microscope image of nanofibers okay you can see the lines white in the white lines showing you you can have the, just having the optical microscope image of nanofibers or on the right hand side the figure you can see that this is a scanning electron microscope image at 4000x magnification what they say this is a scanning electron microscope image at 4000x magnification of the same nanofiber okay the nanofiber that was shown on the left figure the right figure is having the same nanofiber but here the magnification is around 4000x in scanning electron microscopes so you can see the red fiber the white sorry white fibers visible okay you can see that visible now as dimensions are shrinking for materials and devices obviously many structures can no longer be characterized by light microscope this, this is very important nowadays because this is as dimensions are shrinking for materials and devices many okay as dimensions are shrinking for materials and devices many structures uh, can no longer be characterized by light microscopy so for example to determine the integrity of a nanofiber layer by filter for filtration here the uh, electron microscopy is required to characterize the sample you can see this in the it's very clear in the diagrams below okay so the more major, major point is that that as the dimensions are shrinking for materials and devices many structures are uh, can no longer be you can say characterized by light microscopy so here you require electron microscopy to characterize the samples okay see you can see the the magnification and the clarity in the bottom two diagrams okay the right side is so clear you can see the fibers kind of fiber and on the left hand side you require some help so the major thing is that as the as now the the dimensions are shrinking for metal for materials and devices so many structures can no longer be characterized by light microscopy so here electroscopic microscopy is required for you can say seeing the samples or characterizing the samples now how a scanning electron microscope works okay so in the diagram you can see that there is a diagram shown of uh, SEM that is scanning electron microscope now here you can see there is electrons then on the top okay through which you can see there is an electron beam going downwards and in the other upper layer you have the first condenser lens and then you have a spray aperture so, uh, below that you have a second condenser lens and then you have the deflection coils okay on the left hand side you can see this there the certain deflection coils are shown with arrows then you have a finer lens aperture you have a finer lens aperture okay. and on the right hand side you are having a x-ray deflector and an objective lens okay you have x-ray deflector and a objective lens you can see this and on the bottom side you can see the the black blocks that are shown you have this is called as a backscatter okay you can see electron deflector and between on all that below the, uh, on the bottom side you have the sample okay you have a sample that is shown to you and on the right hand side you can see there is a secondary electron detector also available on the in the left hand side there was having a backscatter electron detector and then on the right hand side you are having a secondary electron detector and all this is and on the bottom side you have a vacuum pump available you have a vacuum pump this is just a kind of arrangement of a scanning electron microscope so the main components of this include like the sources of electrons the column down okay the column down which electrons travel with electromagnetic lenses then you have electron detector you have a sample chamber you have a computer and display to view these images okay so these are the main components of this scanning electron microscope now here what happens this is the same diagram from the previous slide these are the electrons these are produced at the top of the column oscillated down and passed through a combination of lenses and apertures to produce a focus beam of electrons what does it to produce a focus beam of electrons which hits the surface of the sample see in the diagram also you can see there are lenses like first condenser lens second condenser lens okay fits through which the this is passing down and you have apertures like spray aperture and this final lens aperture 
Okay, so you, these are there, and these, this, they are producing a focused beam of electrons. You can see in the orange color how they are producing the uh, focused beams, okay, of electrons, and this is heating the surface of this sample. The sample is shown on the bottom side, okay. Now the sample is mounted on a stage in a chamber area, okay. This sample it is mounted on a stage. In a chamber area, and unless the microscope is designed to operate at low vacuum and heat, understand this chamber is mounted on a stage in a chamber area, and unless the microscope, the microscope is designed to operate at low vacuum, both the column and the vac chamber, what they say, both the column and the chamber are evacuated by combination of pumps. Okay, here yeah, what happens? The sample it is mounted on a stage in a chamber area, and unless the microscope is designed to operate at low vacuum, both the column and the chamber in which it is the sample is kept, chamber are evacuated by combination of pump. Now the level of the vacuum will depend on the design of the microscope. Okay, on the design of the microscope, the level of the vacuum will be decided. Okay, you can see that how the lenses and the apertures are helping to focus the beam of electrons on the surface of the sample. And the sample is also kept in a chamber, okay, which is, you can say, which is operated at low vacuum. So, you can understand how delicacy, delicately this testing is done, okay, this, you can see the how the the delicacy of the system is maintained okay because you have to operate in such a way that you get the minute you can say uh, information possible of the sample the position of the electron beam here in this in the, in the previous time we are continuing here only the position of the electron beam on the sample is controlled by scan coils you can see this uh, scan coils are available with you, situated above the objective lens. Okay, these coils allow the beam to be scanned over the surface of the sample. Okay, these coils, these scan coils, these allow the beam to be scanned over the surface of the sample. Now, this beam, rastering or scanning, either rastering means you can say uh, by from string or scanning as the name of the microscope suggests enables enables information about a defined area of a sample to be collected now as a result of the electron sample interaction a number of signals are produced and these signals are then de detected by appropriate detectors you have the detectors available with you okay so you can say that the electron sample interaction, as a result of electron sample interaction, a number of signals are produced. As a result of electron sample interaction, a number of signals are produced. So these signals are then detected by appropriate detectors. These signals, these are detected by appropriate detectors. Now, sample electron interaction. Okay, you can see this the sample electron interaction, how this happens. Now the scanning electron microscope produces images by scanning the sample with a high energy beam of electrons so as the electrons interact with the sample they produce secondary electrons backscattered electrons and characteristic x-rays so these signals are collected by one or more detectors to form images which are then displayed on the computer screen okay you have detectors which detects these signals and they form images that are displayed on the screen, computer screen. Okay, so when the electron beam hits the surface of the sample, it penetrates the sample to a depth of a few microns, depending on the accelerating voltages and the density of the sample. Now, many signals like secondary electrons and X rays are produced as a result of this interaction inside the sample. Okay, now the maximum resolution obtained in a scanning electron microscope you can say this depends on the multiple factors like the electron spot size and the interaction volume of the 
electron beam with the sample. Okay, the factors are like electron spot size and interaction volume of the electron beam with the sample. So while it cannot provide atomic resolution, some cells can achieve resolution below one nanometer. So typically, modern full size SEM provides resolution between 1 to 20 nanometers, whereas desktop systems can provide resolution of around 20 nanometers or more. Okay, now the components in the SEM, like following key components, are required for following these key components are required for scanning electron microscope to operate. Now, first is the electron source. What is it? The electron source. Now, these components, these all are important in the SEM, in the scanning microscope. So, we should know them. So, what is electron source? Electrons are produced by a source of thermionic heating. These electrons are then accelerated to a voltage between 1 to 40 kilovolts and condensed into a narrow beam which is used for imaging and lenses. There are three commonly used, there are three commonly types used of electron sources like first is tungsten filament, second is solid state crystals, maybe cerium hexaboride or lanthanum uh, hexaboride, or then third is the field emission zone, known as FEG. When we talk about tungsten filament, uh, tungsten uh, electron filament, they say that this consists of an inverted V shaped wire of tungsten about 100 long, okay, 100 micrometer long, and which is heated resistively to produce electrons. Now, this inverted V shaped wire you can see in this diagram also, and this is heated resistively to produce electrons. Okay, this is of uh, the length is also given to you. This is a kind of inverted V shaped wire of tungsten, and which is heated resistively to produce electrons. And this is the most basic type of electron source you can see in this diagram now this is the second is the lanthanum hexaboride that's lab6 or cerium hexaboride that's ceb6 this is a thermo thermonic like emission gun and it is the most common high brightness source this solid state crystal offers about 5 to 10 times the brightness and a much longer lifetime than tungsten you can see this in the diagram okay it is having a typical showing a typical solid state crystal and it's also an electron source now, the FEG, that is the field emission gun, now, this is a wire of a tungsten with a very sharp tip, okay, less than like 100 nanometers, that uses field electron emission to produce uh, the electron beam, and the small tip radius improves the emission and focusing ability. Okay, you can see this in the diagram, there is a scanning electron microscope image of a field emission gun electron source. So, now the important term, lenses. Now, the series of condenser lenses focus the electron beam. A series of condenser lenses focuses the electron beam as it moves from the source down the column. So, the narrower the beam, the, the narrower the beam, the smaller the spot it will have when contacting the surface. This is term as spot size or scanning electron, scanning coil sorry. After the beam is focused, the scanning coils we have, after the beam is focused, the scanning coils are used to Deflect the beam in x and y axis. X and y axis. Okay, so it, it so it can put scans in a raster fashion over the surface of the sample. So after the you can see the scanning coils, you have the sample chamber. Now the samples are mounted and placed in a, to a chamber that is evacuated. So the sample chamber can include a transitional stage and tilt and rotating devices. Feed through the outside to the outside, temperature stages, optical cameras, variety of the devices to assist in imaging the sample. Okay, now in the detectors, if you want, so when the electron beam interacts with the sample in a in a scanning electron microscope, the multiple events happen. Now, in general, different detectors are needed to distinguish secondary electrons, backscattered electrons, or characteristic X-rays. So depending upon the excluding voltages and sample density, the signals that come from different penetration depth. You can see this here, how the plastic x-rays are shown, then exploration x-rays are shown, continuous x-rays are shown. So here you can understand how this uh, the whole setup does. Now after argo electrons, the electron, the second electrons came from the next most shallow penetration of depth. So the secondary electron detector that is called, called the SED is used to produce the topographic SEM image. Now, SED images have high resolution 
that are independent of the material and required from elastically scattered electrons close to the surface. No material composition information is available. So an integrated SED is available for the phenomenon SM for large samples. Oh, we have another one more thing, BSD, a backscattered electron detector. detects elastically scattered electrons. Okay, what did you? The backscattered electron detector detects elastically scattered electrons. These electrons are higher in energy. Okay. From atoms below the sample surface. Now, using a BSD, it allows you can say for lower vacuum levels. This BSD it allows for lower vacuum levels, reducing uh, sample preparation requirements and minimizing beam damage. Now, this BSD backscatter electron detector. You can see in uh, electron in seven in SEM. Uh, the samples are imaged using a focused electron beam that is rastered across the surface. So different types of electrons are emitted from the sample. Now here, the BSD detects el elastically scattered electrons, and these electrons are higher in the energy from atoms below the surface sample, the sample surface. So using a BSD, it follows for lower vacuum levels, reducing sample repression requirements and minimizing beam damage. Now here, the backscattered electrons they vary in amount and direction due to the composition and topography of the specimen. So the contrast of the backscattered electron image depends on multiple factors including the atomic number of the sample material, the acceleration voltage of the primary beam and the specimen angle, the tilt that is given with relation to the primary beam. Now the materials with element composed of higher atomic number, they yield more backscattered electrons than lower atomic number elements. So for phenomenon SEM, the four quadrant solid state backscatter electron detector provides both the topography and the materials contrast, that is the composition, the material composition imaging. Okay. By preparing the detector quadrants and adding, adding the signal, the phenomenon SEM, by pairing the detector quadrants and adding the signals, the phenomenon SEM displays material contrast using the composition mode. Now they say understand it by pairing the detector quadrants and adding the signals. The phenomenon SEM, the phenomenon SEM, it displays material contrast. Okay, you will see I have seen the four quadrants in the previous diagram. So by pairing the detector quadrants and adding the signals, the phenomenon SEM it just heavy element. Magnification using full mode for material contrast. Now, operating the BS quadrant in pairs and then subtracting the commission yields to various images for the phenomenon SEM. Now, compositional and topographic images can be acquired at the same location to provide insight to correlate material properties with topography, gain size, or morphology. Now, let's start with the EDS test, that is the energy dispersive spectroscopy. Energy dispersive spectroscopy. Now here what happens in this, in scanning electron microscopy, an X-ray is emitted when the electron beam displaces an inner shell electron that is replaced by an outer shell electron. So because, okay, this here, so because each element has a unique energy difference between outer and inner electron shells, the X-rays that are detected yield an elemental identification. So EDS data, that is the energy dispersive spectroscopy, data can be obtained at a point along a line, along with a line or mapped over an area. I repeat, try to understand it. In this uh, SEM, an X ray is emitted when an electron beam displaces an inner shell electron that is replaced by an outer shell electron. So, because each element has a unique energy difference between outer and inner uh, electron shell, the X rays that are detected yielding an elemental identification here in this. So EDS data can be obtained at a point along with a line or a map over an area. So sample structures can be physically examined and their elemental composition determined. Viewing three-dimensional images of a microscopic structures only solves half the problem when analyzing samples. 
so it is often necessary to collect more it is often necessary to collect more than the imaging data to be able to identify different elements in a specimen okay you have to collect more samples more than the imaging data to be able to identify different elements in the specimen so using eds the sem addresses this need for elements okay using eds the sem addresses this need for elemental analysis okay using eds the sem addresses this need for elemental analysis now the secondary electron detector let us say that the secondary electron detector that is called as ed for scanning elect electron microscopy which offers images with resolution independent of the material so an sed image uses an elastically scattered electrons close to the sample surface for topographical information okay now miniaturization now thanks to the recent advances in sem technology many of the components have become smaller and more efficient allowing the miniaturization of the sem so this has brought to the advent of desktop sem okay and this these systems aim to bring the power and the advantages of traditional electron microscopy to labs that would not be able to support that would not be able to support the infrastructure of a full size system so here you can see in this diagram on the right hand side also this is the aluminum oxide image at 50000x using secondary electron detector you can see how how you can say uh, you can see in a zoom with 50000x the images can be shown to you okay of aluminum oxide but now they are using a secondary electron detector sed okay now this is the another thing that is energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy this is eds okay this is sometimes called energy dispersive x-ray analysis also as edxa energy dispersive energy dispersive x-ray analysis also so you can call this in both the names either energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy eds or energy dispersive x-ray analysis edxa or energy dispersive x-ray microanalysis also is the name okay is an analytical technique used for elemental analysis or chemical characterization of the sample it is used for elemental analysis or chemical characterization of a sample okay now it relies on the interaction of some source of an x-ray excitation or an a sample okay we say it relies on the interaction of some source of x-ray excitation on and a sample okay now its characterization capabilities are due in large part of uh, to the fundamental principle that each element has a unique atomic structure allowing a unique set of peaks on its electromagnetic emission on its electromagnetic emission spectrum which is the main principle of spectroscopy i repeat you try to understand it okay this the system eds it relies on the interaction of some source of x ray excitation okay and a sample now its characterization capabilities are due in large part to the fundamental principle that each element has a unique atomic structure allowing a unique set of peaks on its electromagnetic emission spectrum so the peaks position these are predicted by the mosley law with accuracy much better than experimental resolution of a typical edx experiment or instrument much better than experimental resolution of a edx typical edx instrument now here you can see in this diagram also the peaks are shown for different materials okay you can see this is the edx spectrum of a mineral crust of the venturin now most of these peaks are x rays given off as electrons returned to the k electron shell 
and one peak is from the L shell of iron. Okay. Now here you can see how these peaks are displayed. Now to stimulate the emission of characteristic X-rays from the specimen, a beam of electrons is focused into a sample being studied. Now at rest, an atom within the sample contains ground state or unexcited electrons to indicate energy levels or energy shells. If the incident beam may excite an electron. The incident beam may excite an electron in an inner shell, ejecting it from the shell while creating an electron hole from the electron wall, where the electron was. And if we understand it, the incident beam, the incident beam that is shown, may excite an electron in an inner shell. We are trying to excite an electron in the inner shell, ejecting it from the shell while creating an electron hole where the electron was. When the electron is ejected, there is an electron hole created in which the earlier electron was. There is an empty space. Okay, they, they created an electron hole. So an electron from an outer high energy shell then fills the hole. And the difference in energy between the higher energy shell and the lower energy shell may be released in the form of an X-ray. What happens? The, when the space was created, then an electron from the outer energy shell fills the hole. And this difference in energy between the higher energy shell and the lower energy shell may be realized in the form of X-ray. So the number and the energy of the X-rays, the number and the energy of the X-rays emitted from the specimen, this can be measured by an energy dispersive spectrometer, EDS. This number, the number and the energy of the X-rays emitted from the specimen, this number and the energy of the X-rays that we just discussed in the previous paragraph emitted from a specimen. Okay, the energy that was discussed in the previous, the difference. So there's the number and the energy of the X-rays emitted from the specimen. From can this can be measured by energy dispersive spectrometer. So as the energies of the X-rays are characteristics of the difference in energy between the two shells and of the atomic number of the emitting element. So EDS allows the elemental composition of the specimen to be measured. This EDS, it allows the elemental composition of the specimen to be measured. Okay, so here in this, they are giving you, uh, you can say, giving you an elemental composition also of the required sample or the specimen that you are taking for the measurement. So here they say that the energies of the X-rays are characteristics of the differences in energy between the two shells and of the atomic structure between the two shells and of the atomic structure of the emitting element. The EDS it allows the elemental composition of the specimen to be measured. Okay. Now the other thing is the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is XPS. Now it is a surface sensitive quantitative spectroscopic technique based on the photoelectric effect. They say this is a surface this is XPS. They say that this is a surface sensitive, surface sensitive quantitative spectroscopic technique based on uh, electron photoelectric effect. Okay. That to identify the elements that exist within a material, that is the element of composition, or and or are covering its surface as well as the chemical state and the overall electronic structure and the density of the electronic states in the material. I repeat, you try to understand because this is a very important technique. This X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, XPS, is a this is a surface sensitive quantitative spectroscopic technique based on the photoelectric effect that can identify. You can understand this technique is based on photoelectric effect that is it can identify the elements that exist within the material, the elemental composition, or are covering the surface. As well as its chemical state, okay, the chemical state can be known, and the overall electronic structure and the density of the electronic states in the material. Now, the XPS is a powerful measurement technique because it only shows what elements are present. It not only shows what elements are present, but also what other elements they are bonded to. So, this technique, okay, this technique, this can be used in line profiling, 
of the elemental composition across the surface or in depth profiling when paired with iron beam etching. Okay, then it is often applied to study chemical processes in the material in their as relief state or after cleavage, trapping exposure to heat, reactive gases, okay, exposure to heat, reactive gases or solution, ultraviolet lights or during iron implementation. Okay, these are given. Uh, so you can say during iron implementation also it is used. So it can be used. Exposure to heat can be there. Reactive glasses, gases or solution. Okay, so this has a wide application like XPS. Now XPS belongs to the family of photo emission spectroscopies in which electrons, population, etc. are obtained by irradiating a material within a beam of atom. So material properties are inferred from a measurement of the kinetic energy and the number of electric electrons. So XPS requires high vacuum or ultra high vacuum conditions, although a current area of development is ambient pressure XPS in which samples are analyzed, in which these are samples analyzed at pressures of a few tenths of millibar. Oh, uh, this is in this ambient pressure XPS, these are in this the samples are analyzed as pressures of a few tenths of millibar. Okay, this is XPS is routinely used, this XPS is routinely used to analyze inorganic compounds, metal alloys, semiconductors, polymers, elements, catalysts, glasses, ceramics, paints, papers, inks, woods, plant parts, makeup, teeth, bones, medical implants, biomaterials, coatings, viscous oils, glues, iron modified materials and many others of vast applications. Okay, the vast application. You can understand this XPS is, is used to, you can say lies like Metal alloys, inorganic compounds, semiconductors, polymers, elements, catalysts, glasses, ceramics, paints, papers, inks, woods, plant parts, makeup, teeth, bones, medical implants, biomaterials, coatings, viscous oils, glues, iron modified materials, and many others. So, somewhat less routinely experience is used to analyze the hydrated forms of materials such as hydrogels and biological samples by freezing them in the Hydrated states in an ultra pure environment and allowing multi layers of ice to sublime always prior to analysis. Okay, so let's start with the MCQs. We have finished with the XPS system, so we are starting with the MCQs. So, uh, the first MCQ for today's lecture R is a scanning electron microscope scans a focused electron beam over a surface to create an image the electrons in the beam interact with the sample producing various signals that can be used to obtain information about the surface topography and composition okay i repeat when try to understand the scanning electron microscope scans a focus electron beam over a surface to create an image the electrons uh, in the electrons the electrons that are giving the electrons in the beams interact with the sample producing various signals that can be used to obtain information about the surface of graphene composition. But I think it's true. It is the answer. Okay, it is the answer. Because try to understand the statement. They will give it will giving you uh, information about SEM. The scan electron microscope is scans the focused electron beam for the surface to create an image. The electrons in the beam it interact with the sample producing various signals that can be used to obtain information about the surface topography and composition. So it's true. A is the answer. A is the answer. Because here you are, you are uh, the signals are produced, so producing various signals that can be used to obtain information about the separate topography and composition. Now, second is the given sufficient light, the human eye can distinguish between two points from two apart. So, without the aid of any additional lenses, so this essence is called a resolving power or resolution of the eye. Now, a lens or an assembly of lenses or a microscope can be used to magnify resistance and enable the eyes to see the points even closer together than. 0.2 mm. So I think it's true. A is the answer. Okay. A is the answer. True. Now, a model light microscope that has the maximum magnification of around 1000, 1000 x. So it is true. A is the answer. Now, the main SAM components include sources of electrons, column down, which, which electrons travel with electromagnetic lenses, electron detector. 
sample chamber computer and display studio imaging ah it's true a is the answer a is the answer answer is a true now in sem the position of the electron beam on the sample is controlled in sem the position of the electron beam in the sample is controlled by scan coils situated above the objective lens so these coils allow the beam to be scanned over the surface of the sample i repeat understand the statement and then answer it in sem the position of the electron beam on the sample is controlled by scan coils the position in sem the position of the electron beam on the sample is controlled by scan coils situated above the objective lens i have shown you this so these coils allow the beam these coils allow the beam to be scanned over the surface of the sample i think it's true so the answer is a it's true this is helping these coils allow the beam to be scanned over the surface of the sample okay so it's true a is the answer now in sem produces the images by scanning the sample with a high energy beam of electrons so as electrons enter the sample they produce secondary electrons backscatter electrons and characteristic x rays these signals are collected by one or more detectors to form images which are then displayed on the computer screen a true is the answer true is the answer a is the answer now in sem when the electron beam hits the surface of the sample okay it penetrates the sample to a depth of a few microns depending on the accelerating voltage and the density of the sample i think it's a and the true the second is true a is the answer the electrons when the electron beam hits the surface of the sample it penetrates the sample to a depth of few microns depending on the accelerating voltage and the density of the sample true a is the answer the maximum resolution uh yes the maximum resolution obtained in a sem depends on multiple factors like the electron spot size and the reduction volume of the electron beam within the sample so i think it's true a is the answer the statement is true now there are three commonly used, uh, used types of electron sources like tungsten filament solid state crystals and field emission gun ah true a is the answer In SEM, after the beam is focused, the scanning coils are used to deflect the beam in x and y axis so that it scans in a raster fashion over the surface of the sample. Understand the statement and then try to answer it. In SEM, in SEM, after the beam is focused, scanning coils are used to deflect the beam in x and y axis so that it scans in a raster fashion over the surface of the sample. It scans in a raster fashion over the surface of the sample. So, what do you think? The scanning coils are used to deflect the beam in x and y axis. That is scanned in a raster. So I think it's true. A is the answer. A is the answer. True. These are the references which you can refer and increase your knowledge in this topic. Thank you.